You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. I, as I've shared with you several times, well, not several times, but uh, as we incorporate these, these lessons of our parents and children in this sermon series called Learning to Love, uh, 17 years ago, I preached similarly from uh, a, a series called One Way, God's Way and incorporated some of these concepts as well. And, and as you know, there's only one way to do things. Amen. There's only one way and that's, that's God's way. Uh, many times you, you and I believe that there's another way to do things. But the scripture tells us there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Amen. <laughs> I believe that's Proverbs chapter 16. So there's a way that seems right, but let's, let's get it right. And there's, this is a, a, a subject just like with husbands and wives where we really want to try to get it right. We want to be able to bring out the best in our children. The best way that I can encourage us collectively around that is to look at how God disciplines us, how God interacts with us, how God treats us, what God's purpose is for us because God is the first parent and God is also the first hurting parent. Amen. Amen. Unlike you and unlike me, God provided a perfect environment for his children and they still blew it so that should be of unfortunately some encouragement to you that you do your best but as we've said many times there is this wild card called free will and free will jacks up the best laid plans amen your children have free will but more importantly you have to remember you have it as well and as much stuff as they may jack up, you jack up quite a bit of stuff as well. So if, if we were going to sit down with God and have a parenting conversation, as you complain about your kids, he could complain about you. Yeah. He said, yeah, they just don't listen. Really? Really? They don't listen. Yeah, I keep laying out for them the things I want them to do, and they just keep choosing to do so. Really, I just, just have never, just never had that experience. I just don't know what you're talking about. But he does know what you're talking about, unfortunately. So as we laid out last time, and again, this is just such a great subject, and again, it seems like it's just for parents. It's not, because you have to think about the relationship God has with you, and it has a applicability there. And then also, again, as you interact with other people within your circle of influence, there's a wisdom from scripture that's here that can be passed along. I just, I'm so, that, to me, that is, I want to say it like this, you get to a certain time in life and you start thinking about legacy. And the legacy is, for me, it's not going to be the building. It's not going to be my 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 business career it's it's not my legacy i want it to be simple a servant who preached and taught the word in such a way that it was portable and it was practical and it was personal and it was palatable and those that heard it were able to uh, dissect it and to ingest it digest it excuse me and pass it on to other people if we can just do that, I, I just, I think that's what God wants for us. That's really the essence of, of, of discipleship. That's really the essence of, of, the, of the way I want to, to, to live my life. And I'm, I want to encourage you to do the same. Again, it's not, it's not going to be what job you had. It's not going to be how many buildings are named after you. You, you know, you, you think about all of the great families of, of Chicago and they've got their names on all these buildings downtown. And that's awesome for them. Your legacy is going to be more likely a, a more direct one that has more lasting effect. If you and I can grasp 
the ability to, as God reveals truth, to receive it and pass it on to others. I, I think that's, that's a tight legacy. I just think that's what you and I should be focused on. And the overall strategy that, about how God interacts with us and he's encouraging us to interact with our children again is to discipline us, develop us, disciple us. That's what you and I need to be doing for our kids. Discipline her, develop her, disciple her. Because the discipline has to do with correction. The development has to do with character. And the discipling has to do with commitment. Amen. That is the, that is the overall plan. We talked about developing uh, a, a plan and, and defining a predicament and discovering a person all while depending on God's power. We already talked about that. Amen. But now, I, I, again, just within the context of what God does with us, that's how we need to interact. And so this, this subject of discipline is what we talked about yesterday uh, yesterday excuse me last week we just we were talking about discipline we want to finish that up today but i just want to uh remind you that all discipline just as as it is with god that discipline should be comforting amen and you have forgotten a word of encouragement that addresses you as sons verse five my son do not make light of the lord's discipline don't shrug it off and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son so again the discipline that God gives us should be the kind of discipline that we give our children it should be comforting they should know it is a demonstration of love and it's a demonstration of sonship amen God says I discipline you because you are my child everybody is my creation but it takes the new birth to make you my child. And so again, the example that I gave you was you can see somebody else's child acting a fool out in the street and all you will say is what? Mm. Why? Because that's not my child. And praise God, it's not my child. Because if that was my child. I don't know why we think that if we talk through clenched teeth that somehow that, that the volume is different. I have heard Kim in the loudest voice, Shoo! you might as well have just not even, it's like, Shoo! the volume doesn't change. It does give a different emphasis though. It does scare you a little bit more. Usually if you don't get over here and shut up. That's not very comforting. But the scripture tells us, <laughs> the scripture, we discipline, yeah, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Every parent and every child should say amen. No discipline seems pleasant, but painful. But it should be comforting. That's, that's the biblical wisdom that we have. The second thing is it should be constructive, and we talked about that. It is designed to bring life and not death. Amen? And again, biblical discipline is not, beating your child senseless while quoting a Bible verse. That's not what discipline looks like. That's not biblical discipline. And don't think that I'm saying that, okay, then just don't quote, quote the Bible verse and just beat them senseless. That's not what I'm saying either. It's like, oh, that's the loophole. I just do what I want. Just don't quote a Bible verse. No, it should be about life. Amen. It should be about training, not just about punishment. It should be about refinement, not about destruction. Amen purposeful not when you're angry not when you're not when you're distracted not when you know that that something has happened uh, away uh, from your your child where you're taking it out something that happened at the job or in your relationships or someplace else those are not the times to administer discipline particularly as the scripture says with the rod amen and we also talked about the fact that spanking is a is one tool in a very large toolbox that you should be building in terms of how you interact with your children. God definitely used the rod. We talked about that. We, talk, we talked about the fact that, excuse me, with, with, with Miriam, when she got out of pocket, what did God do? He struck her with leprosy. When, when, when David had the relationship with Bathsheba, what did he do? Uh, he, he told him, the son that you all are going to have together is not going to live. Saul lost the, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, 
uh, Moses lost the kingdom, though. Uh, uh, excuse me, lost the promised land when, when he messed up. The children of Israel lost the promised land when they messed up. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira lost their lives. Again, that's more of the rod. Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10 lost their lives. But God did more than just strike folks with the rod. Again, we talk about additional responsibilities. That's, a, that's, a, that's an option, amen? And God gave additional responsibilities to folks where it's like you're not going to be able to do this until you complete this kind of assignment again removal of privileges again Moses lost the promised land Samuel excuse me uh, Saul in first Samuel 15 he lost the kingdom because he didn't listen amen so removal of privileges additional responsibilities time out which we laugh at all the time as a a tool in the toolbox of people that don't look like us but God is the God of time out. God took a two year journey and turned it into a 40 year journey. I don't know if that's the best example of time out, but I think it is time out. You're not going in and you're not going in for 38 years. That's time out. Of course, the lecture. We always should be able to talk and explain and under under underscore what it is we're trying to get done. Why? Because the the objective uh, should uh, help the perspective. Amen. Being able to spell out what it is God is trying to do in your life and in the life of your child, that objective should help their perspective. Amen. It should help your perspective. We have to keep that objective in front of us, that declared purpose. What are we trying to get done? What is God trying to do in our lives at all of those different phases of, of, of childhood? When we talked about infant to five and, and, and six to 12 and then, and then 13 through 19 in particular, what, what's trying to, what are we trying to do? And being able to share that and be transparent and be able to say, here's the objective everything I'm doing right now and as the scripture says in, in, in Hebrews 12 you know our fathers and mothers it says did, did, their, did, did their very best amen our fathers disciplined us for a little while while as they thought best we want to be in a place where we're doing the best and bringing out the best in our children and that objective should help the perspective couple other things I didn't mention to you last week that I just did just want to uh, re re emphasize is uh, sometimes letting them your children experience life's hard knocks is an effective tool look at Joshua chapter 7 when the when the Israelites uh, went and attacked AI God declares very early on there was sin in the camp but they didn't come talk to him. They just decided on their own that they were going to attack AI because they had just had what? Success at, at Jericho. It is like it's less people in AI than they are at Jericho. We don't even have to send any everybody. And then they got beat back. They got beat up. They got beat down. They lost 36 people in that, in that struggle. And they came back. And then they came and asked God. Joshua did. It's like, Lord, what's going on? He said, you could have came and talked to me before you went, but I'll tell you what the problem is. There's sin in the camp. But sometimes you got to let it play out. And that's what God did for them. Sometimes the lesson gets reinforced where well, you have to get banged out there. Amen. So that you'll come back to God on your knees and say, what the heck is going on? And when you ask God, he'll tell you. They're sending the camp, Joshua, and you got to deal with it. And you won't have any more success in this promised land till you deal with what needs to be done and then there's what I call the potential experience this is a lesson that my grandfather taught me <laughs> it must have been one day I don't know how old I was I must have and my grandfather's such a mild-mannered uh, man uh, but I apparently was getting on his nerves and Granddaddy, like all good black men at the time, had a chair. The chair was in front of the TV. Again, the TV, the big TV that didn't work on top of the little TV that did, that had the vice grips, blah, blah, blah. We know that. That's everybody's house. But he had the, he had the chair. Granddaddy, I was just, I was just doing too much. Just, just too much, too much. He said, come with me. 
he got out of his chair, which is always bad, because granddaddy, you know, the chair is the, that's the thing. I'm watching TV, I'm in the chair. He took me into the kitchen, there was his cabinet in the kitchen. I had never seen this cabinet before. He opened the cabinet. There were a whole bunch of belts in the cabinet. And I'm talking about those, you know, those, those barbershop belts that they, that they have on the side and that, that they sharpen the thing. It was a bunch of those. And I saw the belts. He never said anything to me. He, he looked at the belts. He looked at me. He looked back at the belts. He looked at me. He closed the cabinet and he went and sat back in his chair. He's like, okay. I said, I, I, I think I get it. Because if I keep jumping around, then, then something's going to happen. But he never said a word. And when I talked to my mother about it later, she said, yeah, I, I have a different experience with that cabinet. You definitely need to get off of your grandfather's nerves because I know about the cabinet. But this time he just let me deal with a potential experience. Come on, somebody. Not a past experience. Not a real experience. Sometimes God can show you what will happen if you keep messing up. He can show you your future. He can show you what will happen, and that sometimes is enough as well. So, again, the discipline that you have that God has for us that we should have for our children should be comforting, and it should be constructive. Amen? Designed to bring life, not death. Training, not just punishment. Refinement, not destruction. Here's the third thing, and we started to touch on it. It should be conforming conforming verse 10 says our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best but here it is but God disciplines us for our what good that we may share in his holiness and again it's really important for us to acknowledge that we as parents no matter what what age your kids are right this second. You've never had kids this age before. This is a new experience for them, and it's a new experience for you. And what that means is you're not perfect, and you don't know exactly what you're doing. That's why you and I have to do our best. I've never been this way before. Before this year, I've never had a 30-year-old and a 26-year-old and a 25-year-old and a 21-year-old. Never. When I preached it 17 years ago, Kendall, the oldest, was, he, was, he was 17. I, I, I mean, excuse me, he was 13. I just I hadn't had that experience. And, and, and how Kim and I uh, played out what God was trying to do in terms of the objectives in their lives, it was clear. But we had to admit to ourselves we didn't know exactly what we were doing. And we made mistakes. Some of those mistakes, uh, you know, you, you want to be able to, to be able to make mistakes in such a way that when your children look back on their lives and they look at, at, at what you've done, that you want to be able to have them say they did their best. And the discipline that I got was comforting. The discipline I got was constructive. The discipline I got was conforming. I talked to my mother yesterday in anticipation of this message. And I was laughing with her of all of the different tools in her toolbox that always ended up with me getting my face slapped or, or my ear burnt or, or punched in the throat or whatever she was doing. But I told her, Ma, one thing, I know you did your best, and at least 98 to 99% of the punishment I got was well-deserved. And you know what she said to me? She said, and even if I did get it wrong uh, every once in a while, you got away with more than I know, so again, I think I'm covered. <laughs> Word. I know you did, because I did a whole lot of stuff you didn't even know about. She said, yeah, and so the mother times, just put, put that on my tab for that because you got away with something else. So I think I'm good. I'm like, I think you're good. My mama did her best. Amen? Trying to wrangle two kids growing up on the south side in Chicago. My mother stayed on her knees praying for us. My mom did her very best. She had a lot of tools in the toolbox. As a matter of fact, when I preached this the last time, I was laughing with up with with Kendall and Courtney and Courtney I guess at that time was nine years old and we were having some discussion and you, sometimes you don't think they're listening in church or, or not 
and I said something, and we always joke with each other. We're always picking at each other in a good way. And then she looked at me, and she said, sarcasm, another tool in the toolbox. <laughs> and if you know, doesn't that sound just like Courtney? Sarcasm, another tool in the toolbox. But that discipline should be what? Conforming, because godly discipline will make you more Christ-like. It's more in keeping with his character. Again, conforming to the nature of God. What you're trying to do with, with discipline is conforming because it's trying to conform your child to the character of God. Look, look, there, there, it's impossible to read, for me, impossible to read Hebrews chapter 12 and start at, at verse 5. It's impossible. We have to look at verses 1 through 4 because that's the, that's the part that's, that's talking about the conforming. Again, it says, wherefore, seeing that we are what, surrounded and compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him uh, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down on the right hand of the, of the Father. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You say, how does that, how does that bear here? It does, because he's saying, listen, he's, I need you to run. I need you to run a race. And running a race has everything to do with the, course then he says I need you to overcome that has everything to do with the character and then when he starts in verse 5 he said I need you to be chastised that has everything to do with correction so again let's connect it the correction will strengthen the character so you can run the course amen the correction, which is which is the discipline, which is the development, which is the which is the discipling. The correction will develop your character and you need more character so you can do what run the course. Therefore, as we uh, uh, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us you're coming off of hebrews chapter 11 you're coming off the hall of fame of faith when he's talking about all of the people that did everything they could uh, to be recognized by god as faithful and he says therefore because you you've had this cloud of witnesses i need you to run a race that has faith as part of it i need you to run a race with faith i need you to run it with fitness meaning i need you to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us everything that is weight is sin, but everything that is sin, wait, everything that is sin is weight, but everything that's weight is not sin. If you want to run your best race, you don't run your best race with your Timberlands on. You just don't. You got to get a better shoe. You don't run it with your goose down coat on. You just don't because that's just not, that's weight. It's nothing sinful about it. It's just not going to help you run your best race. So you need to get the lightest material. You need to get the best shoes. You got to be able to run the race. And he's saying, need I need you to run that race with faith based upon the fact that those before you have run the race successfully. And so look to them. Be, even, be able to be encouraged by that cloud of witness. So run it with faith. Run it with fitness, beloved. Run it with follow through. Amen. Stay in your lane. With patience. Lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with patience. The race that is what? Set before us. If God puts you in lane five, stay in lane five and run your lane five race. You're not supposed to be in lane three, but I like lane three. It doesn't matter. You're in lane five. And I need you to run the race that is set out, that God has purposed and designed for you. Run it with faith, run it with fitness, run it with follow through, and run it with focus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I, I'm sorry, I got goosebumps. We 
talking about running the race. We're talking about running the course. And it all comes together when he says, listen, every once in a while, you, I might need to give you, beloved, a course correction. Every once in a while, every once in a while, you might need a course correction. And don't look at me funny because I realize you need a course correction. You're drifting. You're not in lane five. I see you're in lane four and you're sliding into lane three. So I give you a course correction so you'll stay on course. I help you. I tell you, you got to get a better fit. I need you to focus more. I need you to follow through. That's what you need. You need a course correction just like I need a course correction. Every once in a while, beloved, your children will need course corrections. And when they're 13 to 19, they're going to need course corrections all the time. Because just like you, they're constantly taking in all of this new information. They're trying to decide, do I want to be who God wants me to be? Or do I want to be what my parents want me to be? Or do I want to be what my friends want me to be? And I'm also competing to find out who I want to be. And we're trying to tell them at the end of the day, the fight that you need to have is you got to, you got to, Deny who you want to be in order to be who he wants you to be. And you need to let him know we're all on that same journey. <laughs> Welcome to the world, young blood. <laughs> you struggling to find out who you want to be? I'm struggling to be who God wants me to be. I know who I am and it's not good. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I know who I am and I'm trying to get away from myself as soon as I possibly can. Because as soon as I can get away from me, I can be who he wants me to be. And that's all that matters in life. That's the objective. And the objective should help the perspective. It's got to. And you let them know we're all in this together. We're all trying to figure out what we need to do. And we're all struggling to not be the person that we are naturally inside. And so you'll need a course correction. And God has put me in your life to give you course corrections with all the tools in the toolbox I possibly can muster because I need to help you to have a course correction so I can build your character so you can run the course. And we can look to Jesus and overcome in terms of character. Again, just quickly, it's the example of Christ and it's the encouragement of Christ because it says looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is sat down at the right hand of the father for consider him. You start to get weary and faint in your mind. Consider him because you have not resisted the sin to the shedding of blood. He did. He went and did the ultimate. He says, you don't have to do that. You don't have to shed your blood to pay for sin because if you shed your blood, it wouldn't pay anyway because you're not the perfect sacrifice. But understand, when you look to Jesus, he's the example of who you need to follow. He's the one that's standing at the finish line that's saying, come on, come on. You almost there. Come on. I'm right here. And you want to break through the tape? That's who's waiting for you, the Savior. And what is he going to say? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. That's what you're hoping, he says. That's what you're working for. Him, he's standing there at the end. Everybody else that's in Hebrews chapter 11, they already busted through the tape. They're cheering you on, but he's waiting for you to run your race and get to him. So be encouraged by him. Focus on him. And be encouraged that you didn't have to do everything he had to do. You just have to run your race. He ran his, so run yours. And in order to help you, that's what verse 5 is for. My son, and not forgotten the exhortation, despise not the chastening of the Lord. So again, it's about it being conforming. Amen. Correction builds the character so you can run the course. And then last but not least. Understand that it's what? Com comforting. It should be. Constructive. It should be. Conforming. It should be. And it should be complete. It should be complete. And by that, we look to verse 11. And verse 11 simply says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. You got to use that verse in your lecture. 
I used to hate this, but, and I don't even know if it was true or not, but didn't they always say, this is going to what? And I just, I, I, I'm not sure. You might be hurt, but I'm definitely hurt. You seem to be moving on with your day fairly easily. You seem to be going back to cooking dinner after you smack me in the head with that spaghetti spoon splattering sauce all over the kitchen you put that same spoon right back in the spaghetti and kept moving i i i'm pretty sure as i'm I'm sitting there like this i don't know what i did that's a true story by the way i don't know what i did but i know i deserved it i know i deserved it i don't know what i was doing but i my mother was on the phone with Gwendetta albright she was on the phone i was doing something she pulled that thing out swat and she put it right back in the spaghetti and kept stirring I know she did. If she was here, she would deny it. She would say, now you just make enough stuff, Chris. You not. You know I didn't do it. I said, I remember it like it was yesterday. And the spaghetti was good. It was just, just good. I remember that as, as well. It's going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I don't think so. You, was, you never broke stride with your conversation or stirring in that pot, so... But it's complete, and, and it's complete because uh, later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Again, it's not about punishment as much as it is, it is about training. It's not about destruction. It's about refinement. And so if you and I, if we do our jobs well, when we look back on it, we'll be able to say that. But we know it's complete when God does it, amen, because God is perfect. He's the one that's providing the course correction so he can build the character so you can run the course. We understand that, but you've got to have the same aspirational, uh, same aspiration from your, for your children so that when they look back, they'll be able to say overall when we talk about how we were raised and what you tried to do, you tr- we, we want to be able to say we, we wanted to put you in the right place like with Samuel, the right place with the right people at the right time so that when you are ready to discover who you are in Jesus Christ and make a commitment to Christ, it becomes that much easier for you because you've been around the people of God and the people of God have the kind of character that you need to have to get through life. All of that, if we do our jobs, that's that's part of the objective. We want to be able to high five each other and be able to say, yep, we raise kids that know and love Jesus Christ. They know and understand that they're loved and, and that they have comfort from the fact that they're loved, that we're family, that we're always going to be family, that we can say what we need to say to each other. We know how to forgive. We know how to say we're sorry. We know how to be transparent. We know how to say we don't know what we're doing. We know how to get on our knees and pray. We know how to mix availability with humility like Moses did. So when we say the plan of God is too much for me and I don't think I know what I'm doing right here, we can say who am I? Then we can look at God and God can say I am that I am so you don't have to worry about who you are. You just have to rely on who I am. And the proof will be in the pudding. That's the responsibility. And then laid out as we close in verse 13 is the response. In 12 and 13 is the response of the kids. And actually, it's the response of the children to the parent. Child parent, this is the response. And remember, you're a child, and your parent is God. So the application is here. Don't miss the application. It's, this is not just for them. This is for you. But again, as you talk about laying out an objective, here's where we're trying to go with this thing. Transparently, God is encouraging them. Therefore, you know all of this now. You know what the plan is. Children, strengthen your feeble arms. And your weak knees make level paths for your feet so that the lame may, be, may not be disabled, but rather healed. Three things. He's saying, I need you to endure. Be strong. Be strong. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be painful. But I need you to be strong. And there are going to be some times where you're like, I, 
literally, I can't stand my mother. I can't stand my father. And as a parent, you have to be able to say, yeah, that's okay, because you need a parent more than you need a friend. I'm not trying to be your BFF. Not right now. I could be your BFF later. You got a whole bunch of friends. You only got one mama, one daddy. I'm going to do my job. And like I used to tell my mother, I hate you. And she would just say, I love you. But you can't get out. You want to pack your bag and go stay with your father? Okay. But I love you. I ran away from home every weekend. Came right back. That never even made it out the door. So you got to be strong. So you got to endure. Be strong. And here, here, here's, I love the second one. He says, I need you to be safe. How do you get to be safe? I need you to make level paths for your feet. I don't need you stumbling. Part of, the, part, part, part of your response, beloved, is that you have to make level uh, paths for your feet and... and <laughs> Do not forsake wisdom. She will protect you, love her, and she will watch over you. Deuteronomy 5 and 32 says, so be careful to do what the Lord God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. I need you to stay on the path. As we develop a path and we, and we agree this is where we need to go, stay on the path. Make level paths, not uneven paths where you'll stumble. I need you to be safe. I need you to be strong. I need you to be safe. And last but not least, I need you to be seen. Because it says, listen, if you can be an example, you will encourage other children. You will encourage other, in our case, other believers. Why? So you do that so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. You need to do it so that you can be seen of others and say, this is how we do it. This is how it gets done. This is my path. This is, this is how I'm able to uh, embrace what is going on. This is how I'm able to endure. This is how I can encourage somebody else. Hey, can, come on, we can, get it, we can get it with the be safe, be, be seen, and, and do what? To be strong, or we can say endure, embrace, and encourage. It's, it's, it's six of one, half, do, half dozen of the other. Listen to what I'm saying, though. You have to be seen because it's important because somebody can't see what they need to be unless they see it in you. Amen. You got to, they got to see what you want them to be. And for a child is to be able to say, listen, it is possible to navigate this world without losing your mind, losing your testimony, having all of these kind of scars and all of these stories about all of the things that happen. If you just stay on the level path, it is possible to be that person. It is possible to navigate this life in such a way where you, you, you don't end up as a black man as a statistic that has had to spend time in the system. Amen. You don't have to. You can be one of the one out of three black black men do, but you can be two out of the three that don't. You can be the ones that say, here, here, I, I took, I chose a different path. And when you start to choose the right path and, and, and things are not happening to you that are happening to everybody else, somebody's going to ask you, how did you get it done? And that's when you talk about the God you serve. You need to be able to be seen. And what happens? He says, those that were lame may not be disabled anymore, but rather healed. That's your job as a child. That's your job as a child of God. You got a job as a parent. You got a job as a child. You've got a job for the kingdom. Be safe. Be strong. Be seen. Why? Why? Because the correction will build the character for you to run the course. Wherefore, we are surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that was set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame and he sat down at the right hand of God look to Jesus who made a way amen 